Wow. All right. Well, that's another one of those I could listen to all day long. As always, the links of the music that we grab here on Live with the Shaman, the link is always posted in the chat area for uh, those of you to, I guess you could say, pay homage, if you will, to these artists that um, we play. Uh, we don't get any uh, kickback. In fact, sometimes I get a nasty gram from YouTube going, you played copyright. Don't make anything from it. Don't ask for anything for it. Um, that's usually the only thing that saves my cojones is that um, we're a free channel. We don't get anything. Really don't want anything. Except for people to learn. That's what we're here for. For people to learn. So, <clears throat> while I'm getting my pages and everything up and ready to go on the other monitor what we're going to be talking about today today is probably one of the most important uh, days for life with the shaman and priesthood training I will be supplying some URLs um, I know that the ULC and yes the, the link will be in the training um, as well as here. The ULC is a, strangely enough, federally recognized uh, ministry license or licensing organization where you can get your ministry license. Now, yeah, they're kind of the brunt of the joke of everybody there is. Because you can get your dog a ministry license or you can get your cat a ministry license. But as far as the human species, I can tell you, and of course I am and live with the shaman as well as the Grove of the Celtic Shaman, uh, Open Pagan Church and um, the House of Pagans. We are based, founded, and located in Texas. So everything we do here follows within the Texas state guidelines of what we're allowed to do as pagan ministers. Now the reason we don't train pagan ministry in uh, open pagan church because it requires you to follow a strict training protocol that is covered and trained here in the GCS, the Grove of the Celtic Shaman. The reason we do this is ministry, pagan ministry, pretty much any ministry you get involved in, you have to follow certain protocols, rules, and regulations. You need to follow certain respect, laws, and rules, and regulations within your state. Now, I don't know about other states of the Union, but I can tell you here in Texas that ministry laws do vary slightly between counties that you go into. For example, the county that I grew up in, Liberty County, had certain requirements for a minister to be able to perform graveside and marriages. The purpose for the ministry license and the ministry training is to be able to do marriages, graveside, and ministry counseling what we call spiritual counseling. Now you have to understand and be very aware that when you are doing spiritual counseling, ministry counseling, whatever, to anyone that comes to you for guidance, I, I, I cannot stress enough for you. Be careful. Be vigilant. Listen, and some of the things we're going to go over uh, cover over here on the training is going to be more of that. This particular series here in Chapter 5, Ministry Training, um, is going, may cover more than just one or two or three episodes. It may not. We may get through it all in a couple. But I can't stress enough. I know that when I was just starting out, 
some of the people that came to me had some pretty astute mental issues. Never underplay that. There were also same some that came to me that had been diagnosed with everything under the book. Ended up being they were just very depressed and very confused about life and things that happened to them in the past. My recommendation to them was to get a second opinion. I cannot tell you, no minister can tell you to stop seeing your mental health professional. I'll say that again and I cannot stress that enough. In ministry training, never ever suggest to anyone that they stop seeing their health professional or their mental health professional. You can find your ass in a world, world bad lawsuit. Not to mention you can do jail time for it. You are not qualified. I am not qualified to tell anyone to stop seeing their mental health professional. Now, on the other hand, as your minister, as someone's chosen minister within the pagan philosophy, I am perfectly within my right to recommend that you get a second opinion. That's perfectly within the rules of engagement. Keep that in mind as we go through this. I can't stress enough. When you're dealing with people's spiritual enlightenment, that you're not only dealing with their spiritual enlightenment, you're also dealing with all five of their human elements. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know what those five human elements are, as long as I've been broadcasting on this channel, you might want to go back through the videos and find that broadcast on the five human elements. You'll understand that and the three human personalities. So, <coughs> with that in mind, we will carry on. And left. Cam. Yep. Yep. There we go. This way, I don't have to keep flipping back and forth from monitor to monitor if I need to get your attention on something. I'm learning more and more about this software as we go on. <laughs> oh, here we go. Right, okay. So, let's get this up here where we can see it. Yep, I think that ought to look about right. All right, so you'll notice I've, I've already uh, typed in quite a bit. And the um, Clint says, damn, Clint, what are you doing? Do I need to shrink it down some? How's that? Is that easier to read? Right, okay. So here we go. Um, I'm going to be bringing up a couple of different web pages for you. Like I say, um, these broadcasts are done in Texas, so everything I have is on Texas. Wherever you're at in the world, whether you're in a, another country or a different state, which many of you will be, be sure that you Google ministry laws within your state or... Um, ministry laws within your county especially. Um, I do know that before I perform a wedding in a particular county, I always have the client research the uh, research the county and see if there's anything that they might need to know. We have a floating don. Whoops, that was the wrong float. I screwed that up. 
Damn. All right. Floating Dawn. Here we go. We and there we go. Ah, Got to have a little fun with it, right? Okay. <coughs> Here we go. Priest training for ministry, Texas, question mark. I have a link on the training that will allow you to be able to look up some of the basics of the Texas ministry training. And Yes, I know I spelled that wrong. Ordainment, all right. Okay. Now, like I say, the laws and what have you that will govern uh, your style of your or your laws, the things that you can or cannot do within your um, country, state, county, whatever, will vary, might vary slightly, might vary vastly. You never know. So it's like I say right here. First thing you have to do is reach out to your state or country. Uh, if you're in Texas, you have to contact the county in which you're, um, in which, in which, what county in which you will be doing marriage or graveside okay now understand marriage marriage and graveside they're not the same thing um there is also another one that we do that uh, some religions call baptism, right? That we call birth blessings, right? Um, some people, like I say, And I know that is spelled wrong, but since I reformatted and reloaded my computer, my spell checker is working quite well. And yes, uh, last weekend I did have to reformat and reload my computer. It was just all flaky. Said that I got a new hard drive. Solid state. Ooh. All right. So. We're going to find out in the county in which we're going to be doing uh, the birth blessing, marriage, or graveside, if there are any required uh, laws or paperwork or rules that we need to know within that county before we perform that ceremony. Now, in Texas, I have learned over the last 20 years from county to county, the only thing required in a marriage, now listen to this real close, this is only in Texas, the only thing required in each county is marriage. Okay? Uh, you are required to get the wedding license within so many days of the ceremony. You are required to wait so many days after a divorce before you can get a marriage license if you've been married. And you have to perform the ceremony within so many days of uh, getting the license. Uh, most counties in Texas are 30 days. Some of them are 90. Some of them are 60. There are certain words that in Texas are required for you to use for 
performing a wedding. And I'm going to put those right here. As you guys can tell, I can't spell worth a damn. That's the reason I am so beholden to spell check. Um, required phrases, required words, right? Now, don't be a smart ass. That whatever says, do you take this person, okay? Um, usually what I do is, do you take right? Do you take so and so to be your lawful whatever. If this is one of the things that somewhere in the ceremony has to be said along those lines. Right, it does have to be set, and it had the, the witnesses that will sign the wedding license. Um, they have to hear it, and they will sign the wedding license that they witnessed this ceremony taking place. So, in other words, and I've had people try it in the past, ladies and gentlemen. I have, they will go down and get a wedding license, they will do private vows to each other. And they will have witnesses sign it. They'll have everybody sign it, with the exception of the minister officiating. And the wedding license is not worth the paper it's written on. That they, they, it's taken very seriously. I've seen divorce cases thrown out because the the marriage wasn't even uh, bona fide or real because the wedding license was never filed with the court of the county in which these people were married. Something else that has to be said. Oops. You're going to love this one, but it has to be said. Yep, that has to be said at the start. At the start, does anyone have just cause why these two should not be joined? Now, there is a difference. two words. Damn it. I've always called it one word.
And fastings and weddings are not the same are not the same thing by law. Hand fastings and weddings are not the same thing by law. Please understand that. So again, and, and here's the cool part, whatever you do, whatever you say within the ceremony, whatever cash that you do, um, there are certain things that I do personally during a ceremony that I don't vary on. Uh, one of them is I incorporate the hand fasting in with the wedding ceremony. Okay. Now, I have officiated both sides of the fence. I've done non-denominational weddings. I've done pagan weddings. I've done Celtic weddings that were not necessarily pagan, but they were universal Celtic weddings where there was no pagan overtone to it whatsoever. Um, the non-denominational weddings are fun. You just have to be careful what you say and make sure you don't get uh, paganism in there. I've also done, um, um, I'm not going to call it a bipolar wedding, but I've also done um, bi-religious weddings where a, uh, a pagan is marrying a Christian and they're okay with that and they've come together with the understanding that the two different religions are different and each of them will be practicing their religion within the marriage and all of this is covered in the pre-marriage counseling which I will put up here in a moment the point is when you are doing a dual ceremony okay when you're doing a dual ceremony you may well have a Catholic priest or a Baptist minister or someone of another faith there with you and the two of you will have to work out the communication as to who or whom is going to perform which function of the ceremony and the conversation also has to be had the two ministers with the couple and they have to discuss and be okay with the ceremony the one I've only done one and it was absolutely beautiful it really came out well um, believe it or not the the Baptist preacher that was there to officiate that side of the ceremony was absolutely dumbfounded at how easily it went to be honest I was mildly surprised myself but onward and upward right so um, and okay, I always perform a pre wedding council. What does it want? Per wedding? <laughs> ah, well. Maybe it wants space in here. Alright. Pre wedding council. Talk to the people getting married and see what it is they want done. Do they have vows to each other? Do they want you to just carry it 
all the way through. What are their plans? How are they going to enter into the assumed circle? This and amongst all types of other different questions you're going to ask while performing a wedding. Now, <clears throat> back down here, um, required words to be used during a marriage ceremony. At the start, does anyone have just cause why these two should not be joined? All right. Polyamory weddings are not recognized by law in America. So if you have a polyamory couple, if you don't know what polyamory is, by all means, Google it, look it up, right? Or if you have a couple that's already married, and they want to bring another person into the marriage and bond with that person. Polyamory marriages are not recognized by law. In fact, they are illegal. You will not get a wedding license for a polyamory ceremony. However, as pagan, we fully recognize polyamory. We embrace it. Rock on. We can perform hand fastings. Um, I've done quite a few polyamory hand fastings in my time. They are absolutely beautiful. There's no legal terms that need be said. There's no words that have to be used to make it legal because obviously it's not legal. It is binding only to those that choose the lifestyle. Up until about, um, hell, I don't remember, uh, the year that homosexual marriages become legal. You would think I should remember it because that's the year I did the marriage ceremony for my parents. They're both going to kick me. I can't remember what year that was. But anyway, case in point. Up until that time, I had to put in there that um, gay and lesbian marriages were not bound by law. Now, thank the gods and goddesses, they are. They be, and I don't understand why polyamory marriages are not recognized by law either. If I'm sorry, but if someone's in love with someone else, they should be able to marry them. I don't make the law. I just have to follow the damn thing as a minister. I have to be aware of them. Get me wrong. 
I am definitely no legal expert. Far from it. Coffee has run dry. Switching to Dr. Pepper. Right. So let's take a breather for a second, shall we? We know that hand fastings and weddings are not the same thing. And I'm not going to go into all of the different thousands of vis different variables of hand fastings. Because a shamanic hand fasting on one side may be totally different from a witchcraft hand fasting or a druid or ostru or whatever. Right? Um, yeah. Um, but as shaman, if you are asked to perform a hand fasting, you need to do the pre- hand fasting counsel just as you would the pre-marriage uh, counsel to find out what it is they want, what they want you to do. Is there anything particular or any script or anything they may have they want you to follow? Do they want an altar? Do they want you to cast the unity candle? Do they even want unity candles? What the hell is a unity candle? If you don't know what that is, Google it. If you want to see how other pagan marriages and um, pagan hand fastings are done, YouTube it. There are some absolutely beautiful ones out there. Okay? So those are the things if you're going to do a marriage, right? There are certain things that have to be said. Um, I usually give it about five seconds, and it's a long-ass five seconds. When I say, does any, can anyone show or does anyone show just cause why these two should not be joined in um, legal wed or legal matrimony? Or uh, usually what I say is, does anybody show just cause or can anybody show just cause why these two should not be married? And I usually give it about five seconds. And there are typically sometimes either the, the bride or the groom or the groom and the groom or the bride and the bride. One of them might be looking out at someone going, giving them the stare, the look. Like, don't you dare. Right. Once that silence, we shall commence. I will look, you, I will generally look out at the crowd and say, you know, a marriage ceremony is a wonderful thing. It's, it's the coming together of two people. It's the coming together of two souls as one, and yet the recognition of two souls. And it depends on the people, and it depends on, on the energy of the place as to kind of what you say. Uh, I guess. Um, Clint says, you know, do they want others to attend to certain responsibilities uh, prior or attend or do certain things before anything else happens, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of blood join ceremonies. I'll do them. I've done them. But I'm not going to hold the blade. It's just outside of my core to do. I don't actually have a problem with them. They're just not my thing. I've done them. Um, I've done one. It was a blood ceremony many, many years ago where it hurts me just thinking about it. Um, the couple that got married drew a knife across the palm of their hand. And the other one drew a knife across the palm of their hand. And we bound their hands together with the ribbon through the ceremony. Luckily, it was done outside because these two people were dripping blood everywhere. Like I say, luckily it was done outside. You know, then I've had people use um, a, a needle poke and, you know, just... During the ceremony, they'll do this, you know. So a, a blood join is doable. Yes, we do them. Um, I've done them. So, you know, that type of thing. 
and and the types of things that you know during the um, pre wedding pre wedding council pre marriage council is when you find out all these things. These are things you need to think about as performing the ceremony because I promise you, they're not going to be thinking about them. So I recommend, and I've always done it, you get a list together when someone says, will you perform our ceremony? Next question, is it a wedding or is it a hand fasting? Their answer dictates your next set of questions. Now, I'm not going to put all of those questions in this training because I would think by now as a priest, you have either attended or researched or um, helped with or associated yourself with different types of pagan hand fastings and weddings. If you have not, I strongly recommend that you um, YouTube it, Google it, watch some different types of hand fastings to give yourself ideas if you've never done one. And you know, you might actually want to reach out to your teacher for a little bit more explanation. Maybe a dry run, if you will. Right. So that's about what there is in weddings. I do, uh, I do want to show you these two websites and kind of go over it a little bit with you. before we carry on to the rest of ministry. Now you can see now you can see why this might well last a while. All right. So right here is the marriage laws in Texas. Now, this is on the UU site. GetOrdained.org the, um, the link is in the training which I will upload to the OpenGCS later. And there will be a link in the OpenGCS. But this is on that site. And they have some really good information. Now, right here, if you haven't yet become ordained, the first step, um, you know, for anyone is to become a legal minister. Now, most states... Most states do recognize the UU license for ministry. They do recognize it. Now, to be honest, I got mine in 2000 or 2001. I don't remember the process to do it, but I will pull it up here in just a moment. What I did way back then was went with the classic wedding kit. And we'll go ahead and we'll open those in separate tabs. Right. How to officiate a wedding. Now, here's where any, you know, materials or documents or whatever uh, you may have to, if, if a particular county in your particular area I can bring that up a bit here. There we go. If a particular county and a particular area require you to have certain things, um, documentation or whatever, I have never run into that. I have never run into that. If you're curious and you're in Texas, about halfway down this page is a link where you can find your particular county. Now, when we married my parents, when we did that ceremony, I, um, I came in here and I clicked on Collin County and 
uh, we gave them a call and we said hey you know we're uh, my husband's already an ordained minister is there anything particularly special we need to file with the county courthouse before we continue on with this thing the only question the lady asked was is your husband an ordained minister yes has he ever done weddings before yes is he aware of the paperwork that needs to be filed that is recognized by the state of Texas yes problem solved issue done have a nice day thank you very much it was that simple but it's always good to check and be sure um, different things that you might need to perform a, a wedding in Texas and then it gives you ideas uh, different ideas of things that you might want to do here are your direct marriage laws All right. um, and of course Texas does they don't advertise it but they do and this is federal law okay federal law Texas has to recognize alternative religions other than Christianity or Jewish a person who is an officer of a religious organization and who is authorized by the organization to perform and conduct a ceremony <coughs> now <coughs> if you want to know what exactly the ministry laws are in your area do you know that in Texas those are absolutely almost impossible to find uh, back in 2000 we stumbled onto a document that did say uh, it did say that three people in your congregation you do have to have at least three people in your congregation that recognize you as a minister performing a wedding you have to have at least three people there that recognize you as a minister performing that wedding well you've already got four because you have to have two witnesses and you have to have a couple yeah it's getting married male female male male female female whatever um, uh, there there's two people it takes two people to make a wedding unless one person is going to marry themselves and uh, that's not legal I'm not even gonna go there so but this is uh, this is a real good page and it, it ladies and gentlemen you got to understand I am NOT a big proponent for um, the ULC I, I could care less but it's the easiest way to do it it really is it's it's the easiest way to do it and I mean yeah okay they're in it to make money okay I can tell you in 2000 when I did mine was my mine I think was 1999 well, welcome to inflation and then there is you know just the kits and I joked around and thought about getting me one of those um, you know there's the kits and the different things uh, the different things that need to come across emergency wedding kit Wow they they've really actually uh, really actually grown a lot really so um, the UU church is there it's out there and there was another one I wanted to show you give me that all right so this is wiki how I mean it's it is what it is <clears throat> I found it I thought it was interesting information um, becoming a minister requires that you play a significant role in people's lives during momentous occasions a minister uh, you can officiate wedding ceremonies and funerals also known as graveside are to pagans rites of passage um, 
choose to become a minister in order to follow the religious path, uh, you can work as a chaplain, uh, start churches, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is another cute little page. No, I didn't save it. No, I'm not going to bookmark it. I may never use it again. I just happen to really like that one paragraph. Okay. So, because of the way time goes, I want to recap. We're 15 minutes before the hour. And I know that a lot of this is extremely daunting. It, some of you may think it's overwhelming. Some of you may think, why the hell bother? Wedding ceremonies are beautiful. Birth blessings. Um, what we call paganings. I need to put that in there. Uh, hand passing, baptism. Paganing. Yes. Paganing, it, it, that's not actually a word, but it is now. We've called them that for years, Pekinings. So, next week, we're going to go over Part 6. What is the minister's responsibilities? Really? Priest training point six. What is the minister's responsibilities? So let's recap. Let's recap. Get my damn mouse back over where I'm supposed to be. Right. So what have we covered today? Well, we talked about ministry laws. We talked about the things that you need to be able to perform a paganing, a wedding, a graveside, or a funeral. What it takes and where you can get your ministry license. And like I say, as the ULC um, means nothing to me with the exception of a legal entity recognized by the federal government as a place to receive your ministry license. I have actually in the past, early on, I haven't had the problem in the last 15 years or so, but when I first started out, the look on people's faces when a pagan minister came to calling at their courthouse. Where is your license? Right there. How long have you been practicing? Well, I've been studying for many years. I got my license in 2000. They have no choice but to recognize it. Now, don't get huffy with them. Don't walk in there with a chip on your shoulder expecting them to knock it off because they will. They be um, county clerks. You would be amazed at the amount of power that a county clerk actually has. A county clerk has the power to make your life a living hell. So remember that. The other things you're going to want to remember in studying this document Research, research, research. Ask questions. Learn. Get with your teacher 
as to tips and tricks and things that they've done in performing ceremonies of the past. Do some dry runs. Um, get you a couple of sticks and put them up there and practice tying the ribbons. Get your teacher to show you how to tie a three-stranded six-foot ribbon. Oh, what are the three strands for, you say? Well, the three strands represent the family. Whether you're going to have children or not, if you're going to have children, the third strand is for the bonding of those children. If you're not going to have human children, I know many, many, many people, us included, that our cats are our children. We also have a two-legged child. We have three four-legged children and one two. Sometimes I wonder which one is which. I'm joking. But when you're studying the ministry, read it and look at it as, as if it's a part of you because it is. So, <clears throat> I asked you to keep in mind when you're going through these training broadcasts. I do them because I enjoy doing them. I do them for those who are coming up that are learning the young people and the older people alike that are learning what it's all about. People have asked me for years, what is a pagan minister? Why? Why do we need a pagan minister? Well, you may not. Well, it's not my responsibility to answer that question. And shamans coming up in the grove of the Celtic shaman have always wanted written training documentation. Well, we're doing it. We're doing it on the fly and we're videoing it as we go because it helps me remember what the hell needs to be written. But that's it for today. Thank you for watching. We will see you next week with part six of Pagan Ministry Training. Have a great day.